welcome all of you here and those of you watching online to Venia Church. Venia means grace, and we are all about sharing God's grace by loving people because God accepts us as we are, and He sees the potential of who we can be. And God's Word changes lives, and so this morning we're going to be in Romans chapter 13 and also in 1 Samuel chapter 8. And I want to talk to you all this morning about authority, because each of us is under authority and we're in authority. And I want to share a story with you this morning about the subject of authority. It, the story goes that sometime close to the battlefield over 200 years ago, a man in civilian clothes rode past a small group of exhausted, battle-weary soldiers digging an obviously important defensive position. The section leader, making no effort to help, was shouting orders, threatening punishment if the work was not completed within the hour. Why are you, help? Why, why are you not helping, asked the stranger on horseback. I'm in charge. These men do as I tell them, said the section leader, adding, help them yourself if you feel strongly about it. The section leader surprised. The stranger dismounted and helped the men until the job was finished. Before leaving, the stranger congratulated the men for their work and approached the puzzled section leader. You should notify top command next time your rank prevents you from supporting your men, and I will provide a more permanent solution, said the stranger. Up close, the section leader now recognized General Washington. And also the lesson that he'd just been taught. Now, this story is allegedly based on truth. And however, there's similar examples found all throughout history and, and even in modern times as well. But the story's message is more important than its historical accuracy. To be in leadership, we also have to understand that we are not only in authority, but we are under authority. And so the title of this morning's message is Authority, as we continue in our sermon series through the book of Romans entitled Living Forever by Grace. We've talked about the principles of the gospel, we've talked about the problems of the gospel, and today we're talking about the practice of the gospel. Uh, last week we finished chapter 12 and we talked about how passion plus belief equals behavior. How we behave affects all the areas of our life. Last week we talked about how our behavior affects our interactions with other believers. And we also talked about how our behavior inter it affects our interactions with the non-believer, and today Paul's going to switch gears. He's going to talk to us about how our behavior, inter, uh, it, it affects our interactions with the governing authorities in our lives. And I just want to ask real quick, how many people here are either current or former members of our United States military? Several of you. Thank you so much for your service. Thank you. Now, I'm going to just make a guess here for a moment. There are some things that our current president has done or is doing that you guys don't agree with. Now, I'm not here to bash the president. I'm just saying there's, there's some things that you don't agree with. Now, I guarantee everybody in this room that if President Obama were to walk in here, those men and women that raised their hand would stand up and they would salute him. Because it has everything to do with what type of men and women they are. They are men and women of honor. And that is what God has called you and me to be as Christians, as we interact with our government. We are to be men and women of honor. And at any given point in your life, in my life, we are either in authority or we are under authority. When we are in authority, we expect the people under our authority to respect us, to honor us, to do what we tell them to do. You take a look at George Washington and his ability to lead and at the same time be a support to the men and women under him. Great leaders are first great followers. You can't be a good leader if you're not a good follower. You can't give direction well if you don't know how to receive direction well. And so every great leader all throughout 
the, the history of this world, every great leader has always known how to be a great follower, including our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So, obviously, if God's going to tell us to be honorable people as we deal with our government, he's going to give us the knowledge to know how to do that. And so Paul's going to give us this morning three reasonable expectations that you and I should have when it comes to our interaction with the government. And the first thing is they, that is the government, they should expect that we would submit to their authority in our lives. That's a reasonable expectation. The Lord tells us through the Apostle Paul in chapter 13 of Romans, beginning at verse 1, that we should let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Every soul, the believer and the unbeliever, Everybody on this earth should submit to the governing authorities. All authorities have been given and appointed by God. Now, this is a hard pill for you and me to swallow sometimes because there's things that the government and things that the people that are in leadership and governing authorities in our lives, there's things that they do that we don't like. And that's not unique to us. That's all of mankind. You ask a Jew back when Hitler was in authority, if they liked what he did, you would hear they would say, absolutely not. And yet the authority on this earth has been given by God. So Stalin and Hitler and all the terrible leaders, Pontius Pilate and Nero, and it's just terrible people they have authority given to them by God. That's hard for us to understand. It's a hard pill to swallow. Now, notice that neither Jesus nor Paul ever denied or criticized the authority over them. In fact, we read in John chapter 19 that Pilate said to Jesus, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? I love how Jesus answered. He said to him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Amazing. Here we see Jesus himself, the creator of this world, the one who saved you and me, submitting to this authority that Pilate had to condemn him to death. And him knowing you have no authority unless my dad gave it to you. But he submitted to that authority. Amazing. And that, that's when you and I take a look at the scriptures and we look at authority and understanding that there is no authority unless God has given it, you would not be saved if Jesus didn't submit to that authority. We are saved because Jesus went to the cross. He lived that perfect life and he submitted to that authority. Amazing. And so when we see leaders doing terrible things, we need to understand that in the background, God has got something going on. He's working something out. And he says he'll take all the things in our lives, the good and the bad, and work them out for good for us as we love him and we're called according to his purposes. And so now there's all sorts of government uh, agencies and governmental organizations all throughout this world. You have democracy, which we live in. A democracy is a government chosen by election where the right to vote is not limited by a person's wealth or race. In other words, everybody that's a citizen gets a say. There's a totalitarian government style like modern-day North Korea. It's characterized by a highly centralized and coercive authority that regulates nearly every aspect of public and private life. I thank God that I live in America. Amazing. <laughs> Uh, there's the monarchy style of government we find in the UK, a government ruled by royalty. Now, in this system of government, an individual inherits the role and then expects to pass it along to their heir. You have theocracies. Now, a theocracy is a government uh, by which the immediate direction of God through his ministers and representatives. So God's the one governing his people. Now, I would love it if that's the government style that we would have. 
wouldn't that be ideal that God was just the one that's in control and God's the one giving all the direction and everything goes the way God says it should go? I think that would be great. Isn't there a point in time when that was the way it was? Where, where did we come to this point where God's people are under a government ruled by people? Well, hold your place with me, if you would, in Romans chapter 13. Turn over to 1 Samuel chapter 8, and I want to talk to you this morning briefly about a theocracy. We find this in the, uh, 1 Samuel in chapter 8, uh, because at one point all of God's people were in a theocracy. God did govern His people. Let's take a look at verse 1 of chapter 8. Now it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. Verse 3, his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain, took bribes, and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Look, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. God's people were in a theocracy, but they wanted to be in a monarchy. Now, even in a theocracy, God uses imperfect people to help with the governing. He used judges in this case. Judges were a ruler or a military leader, as uh, well as someone who presided over legal hearings. Now, Samuel's son, weren't, they weren't doing the job the, the way that they should have done. People didn't like it the way God had it set up, and so they wanted it to be different. They wanted to be like everyone else. And this is where mankind falls every time. Romans chapter 12, we learned this just a few weeks ago. It says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. God doesn't want us to conform to this world. He wants us to be transformed. And these people, they're saying, look, we know that God's the one that's ruling us, but we, we just want to be like everyone else. Make us a king. We want to be in a monarchy. We want to be like all these other nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord. And in verse 7, the Lord said to Samuel, Heed the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. And verse 8, according to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, with which they have uh, forsaken me and served other gods, so they are doing to you also. Now, therefore, heed their voice." Heed their voice. Give them what they want. Why is God going to just heed their voice? Why is God going to give them what it is they're asking for? Is it because what they're asking for is good? No. This is not a good request these people have. And God says, you know what, just give it to them. God is about to use this as an opportunity to teach the nation of Israel a lesson. There was a point in my life where I wanted a Ford excursion very badly. I wanted it because it was the biggest SUV on the road. It looked tough. It was the one that I wanted so bad. It had a three-inch lift, four-by-four, Triton V10 engine. It was the big boy on the road. I wanted that so bad. And guess what? God let me have it. And right after that, Gas prices rose to $4.68 a gallon. God gave me what I wanted, and he's like, all right, here you go. This is what you want, Tim. This is what you'll have. Oh, my gosh. I get to the gas station, $200. A 50-gallon tank, $200. Four or five days later, back at the gas station, $200. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me because it only got seven miles to the gallon. And when I tow my trailer with it, six miles to the gallon. Crazy. Now I drive a Prius. <laughs> I learned my lesson. 
God taught me a lesson, and I was out, you know, and I looked good driving that Ford excursion. I loved it. I'm a big guy. I'm driving a big truck, and man, I felt good driving that truck until I got to the gas station, and God's like, no, see, you, you're you're not being frugal. You're not spending your money wisely, Tim. But God always gives us a warning. My father-in-law came to me. He's like, Tim, you're going to buy that big old truck? That's dumb. What do you mean that's dumb? It's awesome. Come on. And I'm trying to explain to him why it's such a cool truck. And he's like, Tim, the gas prices are going up. You've got this, 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 and that. You, you, know, you really should think about it. And he's warning me. And I went out and I bought it anyways. Well, God's about to warn the nation of Israel. Give them that warning. He says, give them what they want. However, you shall solemnly forewarn them and show them the behavior of the king who will rule over them. There's going to be consequences to what it is that they want. What are those consequences going to be? Let's take a look. Here we go. He will take your sons and appoint them for his own chariots, and to be his horsemen, and some will run before his chariots. He will appoint captains over his thousands and captains over his fifties, will set some to plow his ground and reap his harvest, and some will make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers, cooks, and bakers, and he will take the best of your fields, your vineyards, your olive groves, and give them to his servants. He will take a tenth of your grain and your vintage and give it to his officers and servants. He will take your male servants and your female servants, your finest young men and your donkeys, and put them to his work. He will take a tenth of your sheep, and you will be his servants, and you will cry out. In that day, because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourself, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. That is a lot. I mean, if you're going to go down this road, this is going to happen, this is going to happen, this is going to happen, all these things, and you're going to come crying to me, and I'm not going to hear you. And he gives them that forewarning. And so what did the people do? The people said, okay, well, I guess if that's it, then I'm just, well, we'll just stick with you, God. No. They bought the Ford Excursion. They did just what I did. They're like, no, no. In verse 10, they, all the words, the Lord, you know, Samuel told all the, the words to them. This is what's going to happen in verse 19. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, no, but we will have a king over us that we may also be like all the nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles that we may be like all the other nations, that we can be just like everybody else. That was not God's intentions for Israel. God wanted to make Israel something special and they just wanted to be like everyone else and it says that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles had they not studied history they every time they brought the lord out before them into battle they won god had won tons of battles for them just the prior chapter they had just won a battle for the nation of israel god had already been doing all these things israel didn't want a king. They already had a king. They wanted the image of a king. They wanted someone they could look at with their own eyes that looked like what they thought a king should look like. And so in verse 21, Samuel heard all the words of the people and he repeated them in the hearing of the Lord. So the Lord said to Samuel, heed their voice and make them a king. And Samuel said to the men of Israel, every man go to his city. And so in this, God's people made the turn from a theocracy to a monarchy. They chose who they wanted, this tall, handsome man named Saul. God had somebody picked out that would have done the right job, but no, they wanted who they thought looked the role. God gave that person to them. And that person, Saul, was a terrible, terrible king, doing things that were totally evil in the sight of God. And today, all of God's people fall under some sort of government. 
Each and every one of us are in authority and we're under authority. And the Lord gives us the commandment to submit to the governing authority in our lives. Turn back with me, if you would, to Romans chapter 13. God says we are not to resist the authorities that are over us. Verse number two, whoever resists the authority resist the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. And so God doesn't want us resisting the government. In fact, he frowns on civil uprising. The government has a reasonable expectation that you and I would submit to their authority in our lives. But we, you and I as believers, should have some expectations as well. Paul goes on to give fi- the two final expectations regarding authorities that we're going to discuss today. And the second one that he lists is that we, that is believers, should expect the authorities to reward success. Verse 3 says, For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good. And you will have praise from the same, for he is God's minister to you for good. Listen, the only people that should be afraid of law enforcement are people that are breaking the laws. I know this is hard for you to believe, but I wasn't always a pastor. There was a brief time, and I say brief because when I was going through it, it seemed like forever. But there was like a couple years where I was just out partying. I, it was all about me. I was out drinking. I was out doing drugs. I was doing, if it was pleasing to me, I was finding a way to do it. And if I got pulled over by the law enforcement, do you think I was scared? Absolutely. I mean, they had, they had to see it written all over my face, my hands shaking. Oh my gosh. Okay. What do I have on me? Where is it? Are they going to find it? And, and I would just be panicked. Because law enforcement had pulled me over. Now, fast forward to today. If I get pulled over by law enforcement, do you think I'm scared now? No. I don't have anything to be afraid of. I haven't done anything wrong. I don't have anything illegal on me. There's no reason for me to be afraid. If I got pulled over today, I'd probably wonder if they had the right person. Not because I'm perfect, but because I've grown out of that stage in my life and I'm out being a law-abiding citizen. I don't have anything to worry about. And in fact, you and me as believers in God, we should be the type of citizens that they praise. And for the most part, they will because you and I as believers should be the best citizens that there are. Honest citizens, hardworking citizens with good families, training up our children because you and me are in authority and we are under authority. We're either in law enforcement or we're a teacher or we're the boss at work or we have children. Somehow we are in authority. And if we want the people under us to respect us, especially when it comes to our children, if we want them to respect, they got to see us respecting the authorities in our lives. We should be training them up to understand this concept. God wants us to be men and women of honor. You and I should set the example. Well, not only should we expect the government to reward success, the last expectation that Paul shares with us here is that you and I should expect that the authorities would punish failure. It goes on to say, but if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Verse 5, therefore you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this you also pay taxes, for there are, they are God's ministers attending, to the continual, uh, attending continually to this very thing. It seems to me lately that we pamper the criminals in our country. Many people who get out of jail purposefully get back into it. That should tell you there's something wrong. Now, there's all sorts of things that people do and all sorts of reasons people do to get back in to prison. I'm just going to name a few of them when some people were 
questioned about this, why they did it. Some of them said, for the free health care. I've got cancer. I had no health care. There's no way to deal with it. And so I got arrested, got put back in jail because I knew they would take care of it. Some people say, hey, you know, I was homeless. I had nowhere to live. I had no food. And so at least I get three square meals a day and a place to sleep. And so purposefully, they got back in there because they knew they would have that. Clean clothes, warm bed. Some of them said that they wanted academic training or they wanted vocational training. And they knew that they'd get it for free. I'll go in there, learn a trade, come back out. And so they purposefully got placed into jail. And now there's a whole bunch of things. Like I said, I could go on and on. And there's other lists that to me are just mind-bottling about what happens. And I did say mind-bottling. Um, <laughs> Somebody got it. The things that go on. I, we have pampered the criminals in our country. You and I as believers should have every reasonable expectation that our government would punish w those who have failed to abide by the laws. Former President Dwight D. Eisenhower wrote in an article in the Reader's Digest all the way back in 1967. He said this, law enforcement officials point to the declining rate of criminal convictions as crime itself soars. Courts so preoccupied with legal technicalities that they turn vicious criminals loose to roam the streets. Undermanned police departments almost everywhere, police salaries which are often lower than those of bus drivers, and the growing number of citizens who assume the right to decide which laws they will obey and which they will not. I think that we as a people should be deeply ashamed of all this. I still believe firmly that ours is the best country on earth, yet today we seem to be plunging into an era of lawlessness, which in the end can lead only to anarchy. This was former President Dwight Eisenhower back in 1967. Now, I think if he could see where we're at today, the man would roll over in his grave. The government needs to take an active role in bearing the sword the way the scriptures say. We should expect the authorities to reward success and punish failure. And now you and I are both in authority and under authority. And I know that there's a question that some of you have been dying to ask me as I've been preaching this message. Some of you may have even written it down in your Bible and that question goes something like this. What do we do if the government doesn't live up to our expectations? What do we do if the government says, hey, you can't preach in Jesus' name, and you, you know, we're not going to punish the criminals, and we're not going to reward success, and we're not going to live up to your expectations? What do we do as godly people? Well, we see in the book of Acts, when the church first began, that there were governing authorities that didn't live up to expectations. We see in Acts chapter 4 that the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders in authority, were forbidding them. It says that they called them, this is Peter and John who were preaching in the name of Jesus, called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. How would you react if somebody told you that? No more preaching in the name of Jesus. Just knock it off. I don't want to hear about it anymore. What if a government authority said, you got to stop doing that? I don't know how I would react. Part of my flesh would probably swell up. Like, oh, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show these guys. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell them I'm going to preach in Jesus' name. I'm, I'm going to do it anyways. And, and some Christians actually think, well, it's okay then, because I don't agree with what they've said. It's okay for me to break this law to show them that I mean business. Well, how is it that Peter and John, these men who had spent time with the Lord and saw how the Lord reacted when the governing authorities weren't doing something that was right, how did these two men respond? We see in Acts chapter 4, 19 and 20, it says that Peter and John answered these men. They said, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God, you judge, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. These men were men of honor. It had nothing to do with those men that were in authority. It had everything to do with what type of men and women they were. They didn't uprise against the government. They just said, hey, look, 
whether it's right for us to listen to God or you, you decide. We're just going to keep speaking the things we know are true. They were respectful about it. They were honorable about it. They moved forward with what God wanted them to do, and they allowed God to deal with those authorities. And as we close this morning, Paul gives a final thought on the subject of the governing authorities. He says in verse 7, to render therefore to all their due. Taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Jesus, when he was asked to sum up the law and the prophets, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and what? Love your neighbor as yourself, right? He just summed up everything, all the law, all the prophets, summed it up in two things, love God, love people. Paul similarly here is doing this with this last verse on how you and I are to interact with the governing authorities in our lives. And I love how the NLT puts it. It says, give to everyone what you owe them. Pay your taxes and government fees to those who collect them and give respect and honor to those who are in authority. You and I are in authority and under authority. We want to be a good example to our children, raising them up. And what better way than to just do how Paul summed it up? If you owe something, pay it and be honorable, be respectful. Just do those two things. He sums it all up in, in that, and it's that simple for you and me. And as we're training up this next generation and how they should interact. Now, look, if we want them to respect us and we want them to honor us, how can we ever get that from them if we don't show them how to do it? You and I need to be men and women of honor. That's what God has called us to be. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, next week, we're going to be talking about the urgency to love and to walk right before God. You know, the mission of many a church is to share God's grace by what? Loving people. It's that simple. And so next week, as we finish chapter 13, we're going to talk about the urgency to love people people. Amen.